but I just want to hear more about your story and what you were doing before OIST and now in the years that you've been here, how it's changed and just tell me more. I'd love to know your story. <laughs> and, and don't hesitate to interject because okay. you know, yeah. it's kind of a long story. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> okay. okay, so I'm a New Zealander, which you can probably tell from my accent. Yes, I, I grew can. up in small town New Zealand, went to a one-room schoolhouse. Um, I'm mm. kind of a little bit of a, an anomaly to have ended up here from there. Uh, attended University of Otago, where I uh, studied psychology, uh, completed a, a, my clinical training, so I'm a, a licensed clinical psychologist in New Zealand, but I also completed a PhD in neuroscience, which made me mm -hmm. a, a somewhat unusual person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm concerned about you know people's welfare, but I also want to dig down and find out why potentially biologically things may go awry. Mm -hmm. So anyway, trained at the University of Otago, which I loved, um, and then actually practiced as a clinician, and then came back to the University of Otago um, as a faculty member, where I taught on the, the psychology, uh, clinical psychology training program for a number of years, developed interests in uh, working with children and families dealing with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which kind of combines my interest in neurobiology with my clinical psychology training and, and desire to you know, contribute. And so we'd been at the University of Otago for a number of years. My husband is also a faculty member, was a faculty, faculty member there. And he came home one day and said, what do you think about moving to Japan? Because he had connections and I just <laughs> didn't react entirely positively. We <laughs> had a small child, um, you know, six month old baby. Um, and it was kind of like, yeah, um, I have some significant reservations about that. So we didn't pursue anything at that point. Roll forward five years and um, an opportunity came up again. And um, we were looking at um, opportunities in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. But at that stage, we had a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And actually, Kenji Doya, who has a long mm -hmm. association with OIST, was was um, hosting was hosting Jeff um, for a visit. And when he heard that we were thinking about Tokyo, he said, um, "Well, have you thought about OIST and oh. Okinawa?" Mm -hmm. And um, so he he got us to come over, and we had a great look around, and it was kind of like. Yeah, we could see we could see the vision. Mm. Um, nothing, none nothing of was here. I was going to ask you what year that was. That what we first looked. Well, I first came to West in December of uh, two thousand and five. Wow! So everything was in a, a rented accommodation mm. over in a rumor city. Um, I think there were maybe six PIs by the time we visited. Oh my gosh. So there was really not right. much here. And this, this just didn't exist at all. Um, How could you see that vision of, could you even picture anything like this? Well, there was some wonderful computer generated imagery. Okay. So Kenji said, well, right. this is what's here now, mm. which was a hillside. Mm -hmm. And this is what there's going to be. And it is, you know, those images are a reality. Mm. Um, and so we knew what was going to be and we knew what the vision was going to be. And so we gave it thought and he, just over a year later, um, so we gave up our, you know, our permanent positions at, at the University of Otago and made the move with far too much furniture, far too many suitcases, and um, a six-year-old a six and a just three-year-old. Was the hesitation about Japan from a cultural perspective or your children being small? I mean, it is a big difference, even though I've met a lot of Kiwis in Tokyo. They're all great. <laughs> and, uh, um, but it was, well, it was wondering if I could, if I could work in Japan, mm -hmm. you know, because even though I have a family, work is a very, very important part of my life. And so I was wondering if it was possible to do what I do mm -hmm. here. Um, you know, the first time when thinking about coming to Japan, and at that point it would have been living in a large city with a small baby, yeah, not speaking the language, which I still struggle with. Mm -hmm. um, 
and just, you know, my stereotypes about what it would be like to be a woman working in Japan. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So all of those things, Mm -hmm. you know, were part of the kind of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And it was new, you know. Right. I had colleagues that I worked with in the US, like colleagues in Europe, but Japan was, um, yeah, it was something different again. So we did hesitate. And Japan, for me, too, I think for a lot of people who come here, you're temporary. You're a visitor. You're on an exchange program, which is what I did in the 90s on a professional exchange a few times. And then there was a 16-year gap, and I returned on an exchange through the State Department and the U.S. Embassy Tokyo. So you're never really fully living here. And I would be asked a lot... um, how long are you going to stay? Because it was just, you're coming here to see Japan, but you're going to go back to your home country. So I can understand that hesitation and also gender aspect as well. That was quite notable to me in the 1990s that all the principals we met with in the ministries were male and the women came in with the highly educated women. Came in with the tape. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so, <laughs> it will, and the other thing for us was when we came here, um, we came on five year contracts with no guarantee that those would be renewed. Mm-hmm. We didn't have a, a university tenure system or anything like that right. at the time. So, it was we were giving up permanent positions mm. to take a chance. And yes, we were concerned about the kids, but we also wanted them to have that experience because. Um, we lived in the south of the South Island, mm. which is reasonably monocultural, mm-hmm. where we were in Dunedin. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for us, it was actually an opportunity because we would have loved to have had the opportunity to live overseas oh, as course. children. Yes. And um, I think our children, you know, they're, they're grown a bit now, but um, they certainly don't regret the opportunities, although, it, you know, it wasn't always easy for them. Sure. Yeah. I didn't go abroad until I was 20. Yeah. And so I'm feeling that same way when I see young people here growing up and uh, being so bicultural, multicultural. So I felt like I was sort of fully cooked at 20. I wasn't even sure about taking on another language. So, but um, so now you've really had this long history here and I know there's uh, But you've been here kind of from the bottom up. You've seen this grown. And in 2015, I suppose it was really coming into its own. And yet even then, I felt like I had discovered this hidden gem of Okinawa. And the reason I say that is because on mainland, so many Japanese have not visited Okinawa. Close friends of mine with maybe a cousin living in Okinawa said, oh, I haven't yet gone. And I said, this is part of Japan, you do realize. Or they've, they've only been here on a school visit mm. for one or two days. Right. And I yeah. don't think you get to know Okinawa. You know, you, you need time. You need time to get to know the locals, to kind of get to know the rhythms, to kind of understand how Okinawa operates. And it's, it's a complex place. I'm sure. Did you feel when you moved here, did you have a sense, though, of sort of coming home as a new place, but that sense, it's such sort of an old soul place to it? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, when anybody asks us, you know, what's, what are Okinawans like or what's Okinawa like, you know, the thing that we always talk about is the kindness that we were shown. Mm. We were shown remarkable kindness mm-hmm. by so many people when we came. Um, Mm -hmm. People went out of their way to help us um, and to to make us feel welcome, to to help us with the very many tasks. And this wasn't just the people from OIST, you know, this was, um, you know, our landlords. They took really good care of us. Mm. You know, we were remarkably supported. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what, you know, made Okinawa home for us. And I think also, even though New Zealand is a lot bigger, it's an island as well. Right. And right. so there is that notion of um, island culture. That's and, right. You know, island um, calmness. Mm. No, I felt that my first time 
Yeah. Uh, and, and that would have been 2015 when I came to OIST. The Japanese government was uh, hosting a cybersecurity conference. So this was a, an additional tour that we made. And I'm so glad that we did because it was... It gets under this, your skin. It really does. And uh, first Okinawa did. Yeah. I mean, even at touchdown, I just had this... Oh, and if you come through... Yeah. You're walking through the airport and you go past the orchids. Yes. And we kind of do that and we go. Right. I'm sure. I know. Yeah. I get that with Tokyo, but when you're describing people going out of their way and being so helpful, of course, Tokyo's energy, it's much more frenetic. And you, I think here with the rhythm, that's everything. And Oist, as far as the architecture, and we could talk endlessly about the really the union of sort of humanity with the uh, natural environment, it really does open up the mind and calm the yeah. mind. That's the way I feel here. I'm very stimulated, but you can also well, you, work on things and be focused. And, and you can think. Yes. You, you know, one of the things that I think we often say to the students when they're thinking about whether or not they want to come here, it's that idea that, you know, yeah, we don't have the big city things. You know, we don't necessarily have um, Broadway or all of the art galleries and opportunities that you would have in a, in a very large city. But what we do have is a way of life that makes living easy mm -hmm. so that you can actually focus on the research. You're not spending a lot of time commuting. You're not being jostled all the time. Right. You can look out the window and see the ocean and just kind of breathe. Mm. And that's so important, for, you know, for people to be able to really think deeply um, mm -hmm. about their research. Yeah. I mean, when I came here, I thought, now I did a PhD. I completed it in 1992 and I was ready to uh, uh, fill out my application here. <laughs> but I <laughs> I don't know if I got my dad's brain, though, to be able to handle the, the study. That is, I am kind of curious, though, as far as STEAM and, um, you know, the sciences with the arts. Does OIST have a bit of a balance here if people wanted to, I'm assuming you might bring in social science or arts, humanities people? Um, at the moment, you know, we are very much a STEM university, mm -hmm. but I think there is an appreciation that um, you can't entirely separate science and art. And you certainly, if you're talking about communication as an art form, mm -hmm. it's a critical part of science. And That's right. We're actually always saying to people, if you want to learn to write well, you need to read a lot. Oh. And you don't need to just read scientific papers. You need to read novels because that's where you really learn to appreciate language and, yes. and the ability to actually communicate. Does that come as a surprise to the person you're telling this to that you, you do need to read a lot? Because I asked that, I taught opinion writing for many years and I would get students, they just needed it for their degree. Yeah. And so, and they would waltz in and, uh, there was always one in every class who said, I don't know about this writing because I just can't stand to read. And I said, it's so great that you said that because <laughs> I'm so glad you feel so comfortable to telling that. me that because that's a really good sign. Writing, communicating, it's about vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. And so the presentation and putting your opinion on things or writing a personal essay I had to tell them what we talk about in here is for us. Yeah. That's what makes it special. And whatever you want to share, if you want to share to me personally or to the group, and they would really share a lot with the group. And that was just a special moment. But it's, Yeah, well, I, you know, as I say, I think, you know, we have to encourage our students to, of course, we don't want to stop them being completely focused on their research, mm -hmm. but that if they really want to, learn to be able to communicate about science they need to be able to communicate with people that's right you know and it's not just about writing dry scientific papers although we do spend a lot of time doing that sure um but it is actually about being able to talk to people about what you do being able to connect with people and often those connections like 
you know, before this form, before filming started, we were talking a lot about people that we knew and connections mm. that we made, and that was about the people we knew, mm -hmm. not that small talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. And it's not small talk, right? No, and it is critical talk. It is critical because it's the person to person. I mean, in Chinese Guanxi, you know, I learned that early on that, it, or what we would call just networking. But it's so much more than that because it's about your natural curiosity about people. I get so much energy from other yeah. people's work yeah. and our work may be far afield, but you're centering on communication. I feel like, okay, that's our common that's, ground yeah, with each other. Ground. That invites me then to kind of look at your work more. I might've been more intimidated and thought, oh, I don't really know the language that you use. But that was something that also struck me. I think Oist would be pleased to hear that we were introduced to the researchers, the doctoral students in their labs, and they had to communicate with us. And we were a group of international journalists. And it really impressed me that they were able to explain it. Maybe I didn't get all of it, but they did a very effective job. And I wondered if that were part of their training here. It, it seems like it's set up yeah, so they, that they, they do that. They have a professional development course, mm -hmm. and that does involve you know opportunities. And I, I think you're going to be um, working with them this afternoon right. as well. It's about telling the story and mm. telling the story simply. You know, one of the yes. things that we're always saying to them, particularly because many of our students are not English as a first language. Yeah. And we'll say, use the small word, yes. don't use the big word. Oh my gosh. Make sure that, the, you know, there needs to be precision. Right. Say what it is you mean, but say it as simply as possible using words that everybody can understand. Otherwise, you, you risk losing your audience or you risk miscommunicating. The key points. So we're always saying, oh, use the little words. That's true. And when you're doing your dissertation or for some of these papers that we work on, you often think you have to use the more the, complicated yeah. language to show how educated yeah. you are. Well, we're saying small sentences, mm -hmm. words that you know that people can understand and words that actually convey the true meaning. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we might think of science as being all about STEM, mm. but it's, if we want it to be funded and continued, it actually has to be all about communication. Oh, indeed. I would think climate change, the environment. My childhood was Earth Day and yep. uh, reading Ranger Rick magazine, the National Wildlife Foundation uh, or National Geographic. They'd have a lot of these publications for kids. Yeah, yeah. And Where's so my dream was to grow up to be an environmental attorney. I wanted to save the planet, defend those that can't speak for themselves, the animals and the, the trees. But we use climate change, we kind of ping pong it around and we forget that, yeah, fundamentally, I want to understand this. Sometimes graphics will work, the visuals, but also the story of how we got here. And that's where you bring in legacy, ancestry. That's why this setting is so yeah. significant too, because of the history of yeah. this place and all of the stories that are emerging from the locals here. And I know they have a very strong and active town and gown program as well. And that's something that USC, where I taught yeah. at the University yeah. of Southern Cal, they turned around its relationship in the community and that really helped a lot to get the word out about what they were doing, but also invite people from the community. And, and I think that's one of the things that Oyster is very aware of and, and our you know communication team are very aware of, is it's about actually making the university accessible mm -hmm. so that people feel comfortable. You know, I'm an academic, but that's because that was what I was good at. I wasn't that good at many other things. And so- I don't know. Well, <laughs> But, but, you know, I think people often see universities and academics as as people that are not accessible. That's right. You know, and one of the things that we really want to make clear is that, you know, I don't come from an academic background, you know. Well, I, yeah, I'm hearing about the school. and yeah. I. <laughs> well, you know, I can remember when I finally got a job, my father said to me, they're going to pay you to do that. And I said, yes, and actually, it's not, it's not a bad salary. And I 
I'm pretty much getting to do what I want. And, and that's something that my husband and I often talk about is however hard the work is, you know, we get, in his words, we get to come to work and play. Yes, right. You know, I know. And, and there are very, you know, that's, that's a very rarefied opportunity. It you is. Know, we, we are so um, fortunate to be able to do that. And, you know, sometimes we, we also say, you know, talking with the students, it's kind of like, well, we, we're we really dependent on you. You think you depend on us, but actually you bring the energy. Mm -hmm. You bring the ideas. And if it wasn't for you, the truth is I wouldn't have a job. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's very important to remember that, that the only reason that as academics we have jobs is because of the students who come to the university and want to work with us. It's such a privilege. And I felt that way when I woke up today because I knew I'd be on the campus and with I'd students. have students. Yeah. 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 It just immediately gave me that burst of energy because they also, they keep me young and that yeah. I think of myself as a student. And so your word about accessibility too, that's why the writing and the communicating is so essential because I know I'm so privileged and I have something that few people have. I'm not talking about my work, but this position that yeah, we have as academics. And it could be very self-indulgent and just doing your own thing, but sharing with people who have a real interest in, I mean, I find a lot of people are very interested in, you know, what are you working on? And they, but they sometimes feel like it's a little closed off. And yeah. so uh, I just think the philosophy of OIST is something that would be good for mainland too, to, yeah. well, <laughs> to embrace, you know, even though the funding came from mainland. But it is one of, you know, that's one of our goals. It's one of the, you know, the um, overriding reasons for OIST's existence. Yes, scientific excellence, world excellence in science is part of it. But we are also charged with, um, you know, in, you know, innovating academia in the rest of Japan. Mm. And so we have to, and we are in Japan, so we do need to kind of lead by example. We mm -hmm. have to demonstrate that it can be done, and we mm -hmm. have to demonstrate that it's worth doing. Right. You know, we have to be a model. Mm. And I really feel that, too. And that's why I've gotten more involved at the, the OIST Foundation. Yeah. Probably back in 2015, I might have felt like, well, I don't have the background, the science background as a social scientist. But I didn't let that stop me because that's where I connected with what my dad did. He's from what we call the silent generation. Yeah. He never yeah. talked about his work. He served on the USS Missouri in 1946. Yeah. Heard very little about that until I came across some family photos of him on the ship with, uh, it was part of a diplomatic Mediterranean cruise during Truman administration. But even though he died in 2005, I retained that connection mm -hmm afterwards by looking back. And so that becomes then part of my story too. Yeah. So now I feel like I'm legitimately connected to OIS through my father. <laughs> but my mother was the communicator, so I yeah. don't want to forget her. <laughs> yeah. And they met in Cambridge. So I, I hope you all, uh, she was not at MIT, but she grew up in Cambridge, Mass. And uh, I hope you all have some connection with uh, MIT. Well, that's a beautiful <laughs> part of America. It, it really, is. really is. Talk about history as yeah. well. So can you tell me work, uh, more about your work? And, uh, okay. So, you know, a lot of the work that we do is about trying to understand kind of the presentation of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which I'm sure that you've heard, heard about, particularly in the U.S. It, mm -hmm. has, a, it has good press and it has bad press. That's right. And so we're, our, our work is all about understanding that both at the, the, the level of the individual, what is happening for them, um, why, the, why they're having the challenge or facing the challenges that they're facing, but we're also really interested in what could underlie that at a, at a basic biological level. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do research that 
particularly we focus on um, how young people with ADHD respond to the consequences of their actions mm. because that's, you know, at a very basic level, that's what drives our behaviour. We repeat those actions that are enjoyable or rewarding or reinforcing for us. We tend not to repeat those actions that have poor outcomes. Mm -hmm. and theoretically, my husband and I have worked on a theory called the dopamine transfer deficit hypothesis, which is a biological explanation for what we think is happening for some individuals with ADHD that might lead to them responding differently to the outcomes of their actions compared to other children, and how that um, could be driving symptoms of ADHD, and how we could use that to actually try to um, improve their lives mm -hmm. and the lives of their, their families and the schools that, that they're in. So that's kind of very much in a nutshell. Mm. But as I said to you earlier, it combines my, my background in neuroscience with my clinical psychology training um, and wanting to work with children and families. And so we do work looking at reinforcement, but in my lab at the moment, I also have, you know, graduate students are great at dragging you out of your comfort zone. Yes. And so I have a student who's really interested in language use in children with ADHD. She has a background in speech language therapy. Mm. And so we're looking at children's, uh, children with and without ADHD. We're looking at their structural and pragmatic language. And so she was looking at their language and conversations, their language when they're having to tell a story because so much of communication is storytelling. Sure. How they ask other people questions because that's how we negotiate. Right. And how we give instructions. Mm. So we're trying to cover this the broad aspect of communication because we know that many children with ADHD struggle to form and maintain good social interactions mm. with others mm -hmm. and we're really interested in what degree language might be contributing to that because if it is then we can do something about addressing the language mm. so mm -hmm. that's that's a that's an offshoot in our lab um, I have a, another student who's um, really interested in the expectations that we have of other people and how that can colour how we interact or how we um, approach other people. So she's just beginning research there now looking at how our children with ADHD solve problems, social problems, and the factors that can be contributing to that. Again, so that we can look and say, well, if we understand the mechanisms, then we have an opportunity to actually begin to develop interventions that target the, the um the nature of the problem rather than the, than the outcomes of the problem. How does it compare to, say, New Zealand and the U.S.? In the U.S., with ADHD, I read a lot about adults sort of self-diagnosing. Oh, I've got this. And that sort of being it comes across sometimes a little flippant. Like, you know, you haven't been formally diagnosed. You've read about that and you've thought, well, that must be what my problem is. So, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the adult, we work with six to 12 year olds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my goal is to kind of make, make as much of a change for them as we can when they're young. That makes sense. But, you know, the whole issue of adult ADHD, to be perfectly honest, you know, I trained quite a long time ago and back then people believed that, well, if they believed in ADHD at all, they believed that you outgrew it. Uh -huh. um, we know that that's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, we do know that um, for many individuals who may be diagnosed with ADHD in childhood, they will continue to experience some level of impairment. And, I, and I, it may not be so significant as to, to disrupt their lives, but they may not achieve at the level they've they have the potential to achieve it. Mm -hmm. And so for a long time, you know, adult ADHD was kind of a bit of a myth. Right. Um, um, I've run groups with parents of children with ADHD, and if I didn't believe in adult ADHD before I ran the groups, I certainly <laughs> believed in it afterwards mm -hmm. because I saw, you know, the struggles that they mm -hmm. had to pay attention mm -hmm. um, to all of the content. I saw the struggles that they had um, withholding their desire to jump in mm. and answer the questions for everybody and things like that. So 
I'm in no doubt that adult ADHD is a real thing. Mm. Um, I think, you know, the internet is both a wonderful thing and a bit of a curse. Yeah. You know, one of the things we always ask our children and our students is, well, where's the evidence? Right. You know? Well, I looked it up on the internet, yes, but was it a reliable sure. source that you looked up? And oh, so, gosh. You know, I think there are a lot of people out there who may be struggling, and uh, some of them will have ADHD. Mm -hmm. Some of them may be looking for an explanation. Now, because it's self-diagnosed, it may or may not meet the criteria for ADHD, but something is happening in their lives. That's right. And they need support. Mm -hmm. Now, it may not be ADHD. It may be relationship problems. It may be, you know, um, maybe they have problems with anxiety. Maybe they just have difficulty in their social interactions with people. But they're looking for something. They're looking for some support. They're looking for some help. Whether or not they have ADHD, well, I think that's for a professional to work with them to determine. Right. And I think culturally, uh, there's a group I work with as a volunteer and support them called TEL, Tokyo yes, yeah, English yeah, Lifeline. Yeah, yeah, I know them. <laughs> and, um, it, and it comes up a lot when I'm talking to members of their board that there is this cultural gap. It turns out a lot of Japanese will call that line and um, they feel more comfortable talking to some of the internationally trained staff to open up and they'll say, I haven't really disclosed the way it. I feel. Yeah. Yeah. So is that an aspect? Do you all talk, end up talking about the cultural differences? It's really interesting actually that you raise that because, um, you know, ADHD is pretty universal. Right. You know, the, the behaviors that we would describe as the symptoms of ADHD are present across countries and cultures. To some degree, the way they may manifest is going to be culturally influenced. Mm -hmm. But what is even more important is that the way in which they are understood or reacted to is going to have cultural mm -hmm. determinants. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about Japanese culture, and I mean, I, you know, I'm saying this as a foreigner looking right. in, but you know, harmony is very important. Yes, being humble That's is right. very important. Mm -hmm. um, which puts individuals with ADHD, and particularly their families, mm. in a very challenging position because um, the symptoms of ADHD in and of themselves don't lend themselves to be being humble, to be being quiet, to be making sure that you don't disturb others. Mm -hmm. And so that puts a lot of pressure on the parents, for example, of kids mm. who have ADHD because their children are not fulfilling expectations mm -hmm. you know and um, we're supposed to not make mistakes right as opposed to in the US or New Zealand we all say to our kids well you know that's how you learn yes exactly but we here, did the best we could <laughs> yeah and as long as you learn from what you yeah wrong that's right fine yeah you know, that's what we expect that's what we hope for but if you turn it around and you have a situation where, you know, you're not supposed to make mistakes, you're supposed to stop and think and, and very much consider how your behaviour impacts on others. So it is quite, you know, it is very important that we have, you know, quality um, sort of psychoeducation to make sure that parents and teachers and grandparents understand that these behaviours are not deliberate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to help them understand that simply telling children not to do them it's not going to work you know you can give them as much advice or um, gentle criticism but it's not necessarily going to change it you need to change the way perhaps that you're thinking about this and and also to understand that it's it's not something that you need to be ashamed or embarrassed of. Right. Well, if you take it to the neurological origins, yeah. is it related to the not knowing all the aspects of the brain, but some impulse control? or? Well, if we're right in our theory mm -hmm. about the dopamine transfer deficit, um, what most of us do is our behavior is controlled by our expectation 
of maybe not reward but good outcomes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you come into the classroom, you get your books out, um, you start to do what you're supposed to do. That's because in the past, when you've come and got your books out, you've been reinforced. Mm -hmm. And so what your brain does is it learns that, you know, coming into class and getting your books out is a cue mm -hmm. that reward will follow. Right. And so we are, we believe um, our behaviour is, main, appropriate behaviour is maintained on the basis of expectation and learned history that when I behave this way, there's a good outcome. And I don't mean that they they think, oh, if I do this, there'll be a good outcome. But rather, the neurochemical system and the brain, the dopamine system, um, it actually responds to the cue. We think for kids with ADHD, mm. that's not working oh. effectively. Mm -hmm. And so they're actually responding to the actual reward. Mm. So the cues don't serve to maintain or control behaviour. So you need to have more frequent reinforcement, you need to avoid delays in reinforcement because, as I say, mm. for you and I, you know, we're being continuously reinforced for doing the right thing. Right, yeah. But I'm all about the cues. Yeah, but for children <laughs> with ADHD, mm. they're not being continuously reinforced. Mm. And so we'll often say to teachers and parents, you're not spoiling them. Yes. Reinforcing them is not going to make them swell-headed. It's not going to make them not humble. Oh. It's You're actually just trying to bring them up to the same level that everybody else in the class or everybody else in the family is operating at. You are not spoiling them. You are correcting a biological um, limitation. Mm. This is fascinating. So this is how we, you know, because sometimes teachers will say to us, well, why should I reinforce that child more? when they're the child that's not doing their work. And it's like, well, that's precisely why you need to do it. Because for them, they only get the sense of reinforcement um, when you actually deliver the reward. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, their brains are not anticipating the reward. So you actually need to provide the reward. And we say, a reward doesn't have to be a prize. Or I was going to ask you. A yeah. reward can be this. Right. Or a smile. Affirmation. Or, yeah. you know... That is all that you need. Social reward is extremely powerful. You're, uh, I'm going to talk today about persuasive writing, and I've got a few slides to share with the group. And the first slide is of the front of uh, George Washington Carver Elementary, where in fifth grade, speaking of the reward, my teacher, social studies teacher, handed me back my paper and said, have you ever thought about being a writer? Exactly. I, I tell, I've told this probably 500 times, that story, but that changed everything for me because now my identity as a 10-year-old, it was beyond yeah. just the immediacy of yeah. living in a happy family home to, oh, I can, I have something to yeah. say. I, I can express myself and oh, I was thrilled. And I'm trying to figure out now who that teacher was. And, I, and so <laughs> those connections. And, but it really just meant the world. So I'm so glad to hear about reward in the sense, in my mind, I was thinking it was non-material. I was thinking of it more as, yeah, yeah. this, right. the gesture. We've actually just published a, a paper where we were, you know, a lot of, it was an fMRI paper looking at, you know, regions in the brain and bold activation to indicate, you know, that one region might be more active than another. And um, there's been a lot of work done with kind of like monetary reward, but we've recently completed a study where we were testing social reward, affiliative reward, mm -hmm. get the same effects. Yeah, I think so. Especially, I wonder, you had mentioned the internet and the sort of the good and the bad, and we can remember the pre-internet days yeah. and the post-internet days. And we're aware of the social media world with the, all the influencers that people are feeling more disconnected. Even though yeah. we have these, we can scroll and go through the videos, there's that sense of greater isolation. And it didn't begin with the COVID no. era. It's really sort of marched in tandem with a lot of this technology where we don't have to, to talk to meet face-to-face -face like this. Yeah. Well, look, we... We had a meeting yesterday, it was 
about fundraising and stuff like this. And it was so nice because the room was full of people. Mm. And it's, you know, the the struggle is to bring people back. We got so good at using Zoom. And yes, it's incredibly convenient. But it's not the same. Not at I, all. I yeah. hated teaching on Zoom. Me too. Because, you know, when I teach, and I sometimes teach in this room, mm. I can't, you know, and, you know, I was fortunate I... I cut my teeth on teaching in classes of four or five hundred students where you, wow. you're you performing. Right, you know, exactly. It's a performance. Um, you're not always performing like I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a frustrated actor sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, but you, you could always tell when you let, you know, when you lost them. Yes, and you, you can. Would, Very and you true. would know where in yeah. the room you had to put your attention sure. in order to, to, to hold them, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't pick up on that. And you in can't Zoom. do that in Zoom. It's just impossible. You don't know. Well, sometimes people have got their screens turned off. Right. And, you I know, know when you my screen's that. turned off, I may have gone to the bathroom <laughs> or made a cup of coffee or something like that, or I'm just sort of having a bit of a rest. But it's just, you know, I just miss that one-on-one -on -one connection. Oh, I do too. And and as I say, it can be a class of 500, but you can still have sure. a one-on-one -on -one connection. Sure. And also, I need to be able to move. Oh, absolutely. You know, and <laughs> like we're sitting still. I'm now, moving but, a bit because my leg had fallen asleep here. <laughs> but the worst time, the only time I couldn't teach, I was heavily pregnant mm. and I couldn't breathe to walk and talk at the same time. And so I had to sit and I couldn't teach. Right. Because oh. I always, sure. I'm always moving. Uh huh. Oh. And you and I have been moving with our hands. Yeah, I lot. know, you I know. know. I'm a, it's I'm a real like talker with I my think with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you about uh, gender as yeah. well. And um, living here over time, I, I never majored in comparative. Uh, politics. I have a PhD in international relations and a BA in political science. So coming to Japan really at the invitation first of the Fulbright program and then the Abe Fellows, that's this century. That's when it all sort of came full circle with what I had observed in the 1990s with this sort of stereotype, you know, archetype really of the ideal woman. And I've had Japanese female friends tell me about the, you know, the ideal housewife is the Japanese woman. So then when I went into a Japanese classroom and taught for six years in Kyoto, the women who had gone abroad, and it's a disproportionate percentage who do, Japanese yeah. females who go abroad, the ones who would return would tell me that they felt like they developed a different self, a different personality. Yeah. I, and they go to Australia, New Zealand, or yeah. the States. Yeah. They learn to overcome mm -hmm. hesitancy. They found their voices. They were now different in the classroom. They were more like an international student. Yeah. Not all, because I don't want to re-stereotype them, but I sort of started thinking about these Japanese women as gender diplomats, because I do think that stereotype is a bit more of a stigma for the for the women. I mean, the men have their own as well, but there's so much talk about the gender gap. And these women often, when they return, they don't but feel as not, welcomed. Right. Yeah, so Japanese on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a real issue. And, but I think it's also about language because mm -hmm. one of the one of our team um, did her uh, you know, went to the US. In, at 18, did her undergraduate and graduate there, and thinks of herself more or less as as a you know someone from the US now. But she finds that her personality changes depending on which language she's speaking in, mm -hmm. and it's she said she's not sure. It's probably partly because she left Japan when she was 18, and so she, but. In Japanese, she's quieter. She isn't as able to express her opinions. And it's not about her fluency in mm -hmm. Japanese. But she said she changes. Right. You know, and she doesn't actually like the change. Sure. Because she feels less strong. Sure. Mm -hmm. But the reward cues, though, see, she's getting rewarded for that because that's more of the norm. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, no, I think it's, you know, it really is... An issue, and one of the things I think that 
voiced really could do is really bring Japanese women home because it's bringing them home to an international setting where they are valued f for their minds, not their bento making skills. Right. And I right. mentioned that because, you know, that was one of the hardest things for me. <laughs> I, you know, when our youngest was at Yotia and um, I'd be making the bento in the morning and look, I had all the cutters, I had all the bits and pieces and they were, it was like, I just don't give enough. I know. I don't care enough. <laughs> Do I they almost grade the bentos? Or well, it, yeah, but I, I'm I, sure I, it's the talk of the town if I, you have the worst one. I failed. <laughs> I was a bento failure. But, and I use that as an example because mm. I think it is, you know, I think for women in science it's challenging anyway because we have to overcome the stereotypes, but we have to overcome our the, the things that we hold inside that hold us back as well, that we question our ability. Um, I worked in a psychology department where there were a number of women and we'd sometimes, we'd get together on a Friday night um, and, and we'd talk about things and we'd go, oh, we feel like we don't know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We would admit to feeling mm -hmm. worried about, you know, how well our work was going. We'd admit that sometimes we just figured that, you know, we just would keep on um, faking it till we made it. You know, our male colleagues didn't have the luxury of that communication with one another. They That's had right. to kind of they had to kind of keep the image. Sure. And I think that, you know, um, women do have that ability, but we also hold within ourselves that those, those questions. And I think for Japanese women, it's kind of like a double stereotype. Mm. They're female, so they have to overcome that and they have to overcome other people's expectations of what they can or cannot achieve and so I, I think Oyster is a wonderful place for to, to bring you know the very best Japanese I love back that to idea Japan. yeah um, and you know and honestly I often say to my male colleagues and they will confirm this that you know if you're not if you don't have as many women as men working in a particular um, you know endeavor then you will you're only going to do half as well because you've only got half as, half the brains that you could have. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's uh, I've been here and I'm in my eighth year of residency and I have a lot of Japanese friends who they see me speak up and speak boldly, but I, I have the freedom oh, to do right. that because... With foreigners? Of course. And in my case, I'm not young anymore. Right, so I right, exactly. Same here. And, yeah. And, you know, sometimes... I get away with things because that's attributed to me being not of, you know, Japan. Sure. But actually, I do know the roles. Right. I know them very, very well, but sometimes I just choose to pretend that I don't. But I can do that. Mm -hmm. Where I'm really aware how much harder it is, you know. I actually have a lab, half of which is made up of Japanese women. Mm. Um most of whom are from Okinawa. Mm. And so we actually do discuss the issues about it being easier for me to stand up and say things because I, I don't have to over, you know, I have to overcome my early training as being female, but I don't have to overcome expectations about what women can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of change, it really would have to come more from them, you yeah. know, that because yeah. I love being a role model if that's how they see it, but I'm also yeah. in such a different position. If it didn't work out here, I can just leave tomorrow. So you know? what we but, have to do is give them opportunities to shine. That's right. You know, yes. that's, that's what it really is. It's about, um, you know, about this whole opportunity to gain and to practice and to um, have an opportunity to share. I mean, I want to give you an example of that. My colleague, uh, Shizuka Shima Bokuro, has, has mentioned she had developed this parenting program for Japanese mothers of children with ADHD. Mm. And we call it Well Parent Japan. Mm. And it's not just about teaching behavior management skills. It's about actually providing psychological well-being for the woman so that they feel empowered to make change. Um, but it's actually a group for women. Mm -hmm. Because our, you know, when we did our co-production with with Japanese mothers of children with ADHD, they were fairly explicit about wanting to have it a woman's only group because they felt 
more comfortable to be able to share with other women rather than with other men. So, you know, and I don't think that's necessarily unique to Japan at all. And so I'm not right. raising it as a, as a cultural thing, but more an opportunity for women to work together to support one another and to lift one another up. And I think that's something that, that we as, as women who've, who've had a degree of success need to remember because women are not always kind women. That's right. Yeah. At the you know, at the higher levels they right. we have unrealistic expectations of women. Mm-hmm. Um, we expect more from them. And mm-hmm. so I think it's not just, you know, working with male colleagues, but we need to actually look to ourselves and making sure that we are taking every opportunity to to take our our female colleagues with us. I agree. I heard Kathy Matsui talk about when she went out on her own with the venture capital firm with two other women. Now, of course, she's operating at a very, yeah. very high level. But nevertheless, something that I took away from her talk, and it was for a TAL event last year, was the idea. She said, I have my own you know, women board of directors, and these are yeah. close friends, and we talk maybe every month, but it's just a way of sort of cheering each other on. And yeah. The other thing I thought of, too, was the couple of years ago, some controversy around Tokyo 2020, where the head of the uh, overseeing committee said that the women there, they talked a little bit too much and they didn't really have much of substance. And so there was some moderation, some reform of that. So that image of women talking without maybe making sense. I remember the work of Deborah Tannen from Georgetown about how men and women communicate differently. Women do talk a lot, but it's more in the private space, in the private sphere. So when we get around that board of directors meeting, then the men dominate. And it's just this opposite effect. So when a woman speaks, then it seems like she's almost intruding. So I think yeah. the communicative atmosphere really does make a difference. Well, I just wanted to thank you so much. I feel like I've just gotten to know you and know, know more about your work. And I want to celebrate what you're doing now with your program to uh, help people with uh, and who, whose children may have ADHD and and trying to uh, support the sort of town and gown aspect to OIST as well. Well, I just really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you about it because, as I say, we tend to be a bit, a little bit humble about what we do and we're always about the, the yes but, you know. Well, so I'm going to come to you and say, well, I want to get beyond yes but yes. so that we can get it out there and make sure that we, 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 can connect with the community um, at all levels and, and engage them and interest them in the things that we're trying to do. Professor Tripp, thank you so much for your time and for meeting with me. And uh, I want to wish you well with your work and with your center. And I want to hear more about it in the future. Well, Nancy, thank you so much. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity for us to to meet a new person who's interested in what we do, obviously, but also to help us get what we do out there into the to the wider community um, to be able to communicate about OIST and about our own research. So this is not the last opportunity, I hope. I'll be happy to be a bridge among many others. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.